Hello, 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 everybody, and welcome to a Throne of Eldraine draft guide. Throne of Eldraine is returning for human drafting to MTG Arena this week, so I wanted to make a draft guide to serve as either an introduction to the format for those of you that have never drafted it, or a bit of a refresher for those of you that have. It is a really fun set, and I really do recommend trying it out, and it is way better with players than it was with bots. Before I get to the guide, though, I do want to remind you that if you enjoy this video, be sure to hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment in the comment section down below. By doing these things, you can let me know that you are enjoying the video so that I make this type of video in the future. But let's get to the overview. In this guide, we're going to be talking about format basics, the top three commons for each color, combat tricks and fixing, over and under performers based on what you'd think based on looking just at the cards, and then finally just tips, tricks, and tidbits. Starting things off though, we're going to be going over the format basics, and these two tenets will really serve you well. First of all, all archetypes are viable, and second of all, your mana base is the key to victory. Let's dive into these in a little bit more detail. First of all, the reason that all archetypes are viable is because all color pairs are viable. You can really go any color pair under the sun, some of them even have like multiple modes, like you can be a more aggressive version of the deck and or a more controlling version of the deck, and that really does influence your draft choices. You're going to want to stay more open in the draft so that you can find the open lane and then get really rewarded. Because because if you do end up in an open color combination, it's going to be much better than a bad version of a color combination that is not open, which is not always the case. Sometimes it's more important to bias towards certain colors, bias towards certain archetypes, but in this set, all of them are viable. All the color pairs are pretty self-explanatory on what they do. And so instead of talking about which like archetypes are in a tier list or something like that, I think it's more important to just say that all of the archetypes are viable and they are definitely things that you should be looking to just read the open signals and find. Also. Uh, monocolor decks are definitely a thing in this format which further rewards you for finding the open lane because if you find a color that is more open than others then you can just have a monocolor deck have a really nice mana base and a very powerful deck as well another thing that is important in this format is that your mana base is way more important than it is in normal formats let's take a typical white green deck in most formats a 9-8 mana base uh, if you have slightly more green cards would be a fine uh, mana base but in throne of eldraine this is not the case we'll get to why that is in a second but i would recommend having at least a 10-7 mana base anything like 11-6 or more is uh, really superior and the reason for this why is mana so crucial is because of three reasons first of all adamant there are spells that reward you for paying at least three mana of the main color to cast those spells and they do get a pretty significant boost if you take Vantress Paladin for example which is the card on the far left it is four mana for a 2-2 two -two flyer but if you play, pay three blue mana it is four mana for a 3-3 three -three flyer and so that goes from being a bad card to an actively good card if you are a very uh, skewed mana base so if you have 12 blue sources in your deck a lot of the time by turn four you're going to be able to cast your 3-3 three -three flyer but if you have a 9-8 mana base that is far less likely similarly all the adamant spells get a lot better if you do trigger them so it is important to make sure that you have a a skewed mana base to maximize these cards because they are fairly common. Another reason why mana is so crucial in this format is because early plays are good. The cards like Weaselback, Redcap, Fairy Guidemother, and Merfolk Secret Keeper are all archetype staples, and these are the types of cards that get a lot better when you have access to early mana. If you take Merfolk Secret Keeper as an example, you really want to have blue mana by turn one exactly, because you're going to want to be able to go venture deeper on turn one to start milling your opponent, and then you on turn two want to be able to play your Merfolk Secret Keeper. If you instead have a 9-8 mana base, it is way more punishing to have an opening hand that does not have both colors of mana, and even having uh, double of that mana because maybe you have a blue two drop or you have another merfolk two merfolk secret keepers in your hand and you want to go venture deeper and then on the next turn play merfolk secret keeper and uh, from adventured and another venture deeper then in, you're in really trouble if you have mana of different colors and it can really punish you similarly with weaselback red cap it's much less impressive if you can't get it down on turn one and so you are really rewarded for having a consistent mana base that can smoothly deploy its threats, be that on the aggressive end of the spectrum or on the more controlling mill end. Another reason is that monocolor is viable, which makes mana that is very consistent even better because sometimes you can just go straight monocolor. If you are a heavy green deck after pack one and you have like eight green cards, then in pack two, if you open a card like Deathless Knight, or get past one, you can start playing that sort of card without having any black mana in your deck at all, and just go straight mono green, play like 16 forests, and have a great deck. Similarly, cards like Clockwork Servant can be used by any color combination as long as you have a high enough level of one color. So if you have 12 blue sources, you can play Clockwork Servant in your blue-white deck and pretty reliably draw that card. If, however, you have a 9-8 mana base, you lose access to these powerful cards unless you are exactly that two-color combination, which makes them a lot worse. So if you are able to go into monocolor or be very heavily in one color, then you get access to these hybrid cards and some of these uh, more uh, flexible like cards like Clockwork Servant. 
Moving on to the top three commons by color, we're going to start with white. Number one is Arden Veil Tactician, just a great aggressive threat. Three mana for a 2-3 flyer is good, and the Dizzying Swoop ability is incredibly relevant. And this is another reason why having a good mana base is important, because on turn five, you want to be able to go Dizzying Swoop, tap two creatures, and then play your Arden Veil Tactician, and that requires three white mana. And if your white deck has, say, if your deck that you're trying to do this in has, say, three forests in play, then you have to make that difficult choice between whether or not to play the Arden Veil Tactician, or to play the Dizzying Swoop and then wait a turn on the Arden Veil which is obviously not great. So you'd rather have that in a home where you're going to reliably be able to cast all of those on turn five. Number two is Trapped in the Tower. This card does... Uh is a little bit worse than this type of effect would be in some formats, uh, but it is also just a very rock solid removal spell, and there is some added benefit to controlling an enchantment for the number three white common, which is Flutter Fox. Uh, Flutter Fox is just a great threat. You'll take as many of these as they can get, and it is oftentimes going to be a two mana, two, two flyer, which is a fantastic addition to any deck. Mostly going to be good in aggressive decks, and uh, I will say that uh, Fairy Guide Mother, which I showed earlier as an example of a one drop, is also a very good white common, and depending on what type of deck you're going to be drafting, could definitely go ahead of some of these cards, but this is my initial order for if you're going into a pack one, pick one situation. Moving on to blue, the number one blue common is Merfolk Secret Keeper, and that is because it really turns on a lot of what blue is trying to do. Blue needs inevitability in this format because a lot of the time it is a more controlling strategy, and having access to a Merfolk Secret Keeper really gives you that inevitability because if you are going to be drawing cards, you're going to deck before your opponent, but if you can use even one or two Merfolk Secret Keepers, then you can start to uh, just know that in the late game you are going to win if you stabilize the board. So tiny for just one mana can oftentimes take care of any threat, and is another reason why Secret Keeper is so important important because if you don't have any secret keepers so tiny is a bit underwhelming but once you start milling your opponent a little bit so tiny gets a lot better and then finally at number three is charmed sleep it doesn't have particular synergy with anything so once you know which deck you're in it goes down in value but early in the draft it's nice to have access to one copy of it and it is definitely a nice addition again you can see all of these do require heavy amounts of blue compared to their cost. So Merfolk Secret Keeper, you want to have double blue for that a lot of the time if you're trying to cast that in the mid, mid game. So Tiny needs you to have blue mana. Charm Sleep needs double blue mana. A lot of these cards, uh, they don't have like one and a, co a colorless plus a blue or things like that. They're pretty heavy on those color requirements. Moving on to black, we have what is the best common in the set? Bake into a pie. Four mana to kill any creature is just really nice in this set, and the food synergizes well with what black is trying to do and can gain you those that important life if you are a control deck. So bake into a pie is really good removal and a card that you should be taking early. Again, double black is going to be hard for some decks to cast, especially if you have like a 10-7 mana base, and it can be a reason to skew away from uh, another color. If you have a couple bake into a pies, you might want to go heavier onto black and maybe not take some adamant cards in other colors. But bake into a is a great removal spell nonetheless. Reeve Soul is next, another good removal spell, and finally Smitten Swordmaster. After Reeve Soul, Black's co commons become very contextual. Uh, a lot of decks would rather have other commons other than Smitten Swordmaster, but Swordmaster can really do a lot of good work if you are in an aggressive knight's deck, because the curry favor adventure part of it can really do a lot of good work, and just a 2-mana two 2-1 two knight with lifelink is actually pretty nice. So I think this is the number 3 Black common, like if you were going pack one, pick one, but it is very contextual in black, and a lot of black decks are more controlling and would prefer things other than the Smitten Swordmaster. Moving on to red, at number one is Scorching Dragonfire, just a fantastic removal spell. It's good in every set it's in, and this is no exception. Rimrock Knight is number two. This is predicated upon you being aggressive because not being able to block means that you aren't going to really want to prioritize this, but it's a fantastic two drop. The Boulder Rush ability means that you can keep attacking with your smaller creatures into your opponent's bigger blockers and know that you're still going to trade. And again, it really rewards you for having that double red so that on turn three, you can go attack, boulder rush, play my Rimrock Knight, that sort of thing. And number three red common is Searing Barrage. This is predicated upon the fact that you are going to be able to trigger Adamant. This is doable even if you have like only eight red sources because by turn five, the later you get into the game, the more of each source you're going to have. So having a five drop with Adamant is less restrictive than having like a four drop with Adamant. But Searing Barrage is definitely like only really a top common if you are base red because five mana to deal five is not special, but five mana deal five and then deal three to their opponent is really nice and can, can give your red deck some nice closing power. Moving on to green, at number one is Out Muscle. This card is just a fantastic addition to any green deck, especially a heavy green deck. Um, 
mostly because it opens up some nice attack avenues. So you use out muscle on one of your creatures and then you basically get a free attack because they can't trade with it in combat. So it ends up being like a four mana removal spell that also does three or four damage a lot of the time, oftentimes more damage because your creature just got a counter on it. And so out muscle ends up being quite good. At number two, very close second is Fierce Witch Stalker, just a rock solid body, great stats, and it comes with a food as well and trample. So just a fantastic creature overall. And you're really happy playing these in any deck, aggressive controlling, really any deck. And then number three is Garen Brig Paladin. It just lines up very well with the format. One of the biggest uh, benefits of it is that it cannot be chump blocked by things like Merfolk Secret Keeper, so it's a nice threat to have against the mill decks, and it's just a really big creature for green decks. Though oftentimes, once you know what sort of green deck you're in, some of the cheaper cards go up in value depending on which two drops you're looking for, whether those be more defensive or more aggressive options. Let's look at some combat tricks now, because these combat tricks are really important in the format, because a lot of them come with adventure, which means that your opponent is going to naturally have these cards in their deck because it's a built-in two-for-one if they can blow you out with their combat trick. Starting things off in white, Silver Flame Squire is one you really want to be aware of. Not only can they attack you and then have this back to surprise block by untapping their creature with the on alert mode, but they can also just like use it during a normal combat. So if your opponent attacks you and they have Three, uh, th three mana, including a white. You want to be aware of the fact that they could have Silver Flame Squire so you don't get blown out and give them a two for one. This means that oftentimes you're going to want to wait until you can double block or wait until you have removal in response because if you do kill the creature that they use the combat trick adventure on, then they do not actually get the adventure because the spell will fizzle. So that is why it is so important to know the combat tricks so that you can know what to play around. It is also important to note that a lot of these combat tricks give only plus two power, Insatiable Appetite being the exception. So if your opponent is attacking a 3-3 three, three into your 4-4, four, four, you know that they are going to uh, oftentimes be able to win that combat. But if they're attacking their 3-3 three, three into your 5-5, five, five, then you're probably going to be able to safely block and at least, even if they have a combat trick, trade for the creature and the trick. Uh, it also should inform your double blocks on which trick they could have. Barge in, in red is actually deceptively good. Uh, it does only work for attacking creatures, but giving trample can be really nice because there are some pretty beefy non-humans in the set and so Barjin can do work, good work in those decks. We've already discussed Rimrock Knight and then in green you're mostly got to be afraid of Garen Brig Carver because almost any deck would prefer Garen Brig Carver to Insatiable Appetite but if your opponent makes a suspicious attack and it looks like Garen Brig Carver wouldn't actually do very much for them uh, then you do need to like at least think about Insatiable Appetite because it's definitely a playable card especially if there's some food lying around because you don't want to just get uh essentially lava axed when they do to pay two mana to give their creature plus five plus five and kill you out of nowhere those are the most relevant combat tricks the most important thing to remember is that most of the combat tricks give plus two power and uh there are some other random tricks in the format but these are the ones that are actually good most of the other ones will not see play so if you get wrecked by those you probably shouldn't be playing around them anyway so just good on your opponent for getting you in those rare circumstances but these are the main ones and these ones are uh generally pretty good as well because they're combat tricks that are oftentimes built into creatures so that once you get your value from your trick you also get a creature left behind which is just nice value moving on to the fixing in the set most of it is concentrated in green but again but i do want to emphasize that the best fixing in this set is golden egg it gives access to splashes for a lot of decks it really just does a lot in the format and so golden egg is going to be your primary source of fixing a lot of the time especially because it's hard to interact with whereas roar's thorn acolyte can be killed and you lose access to your green source uh, and beanstalk giants in uncommon so it's kind of hard to get that uh fix that fixing consistently golden egg is going and same with spinning wheel and heraldic banner are both in commons as well golden egg is a rock solid common that's just going to fix you for that one shot mana you're not going to want to splash multiple cards but if you have a golden egg you can splash some something like um, a single pipped card, another color relatively consistently. If you can get a couple golden eggs and then maybe play one land of that color. So golden egg is going to be your key for splashing and Rose Thorn Acolyte can contribute. Beanstalk Giant, Spinning Wheel, Heraldic Banner can all contribute, but they're not going to be your bread and butter because a lot of the, the Rose Thorn Acolyte is pretty unreliable and the golden egg uh, because it might just die and golden egg is a common and the other ones are uncommons. But yeah, Heraldic Banner, I also want to briefly mention is pretty nice, even if you're a monocolored deck because it buffs all of your creatures then. And if you are going to be going for a fixing deck, then you can use it to get either your splash color or if you already have your splash, you can use it to get your main color. So Heraldic Banner is pretty sweet as well. Moving on to some build arounds in the set. I do want to first say that Edgewall Innkeeper and Lucky Clover do get there in most drafts where you build around them. Uh, there is always that 
to doubt when you open a pack you're like oh this card says that i need to have a lot of adventures in my deck is it actually going to be worth it and in this case it definitely is lucky clover and edgewell innkeeper can be good in a variety of archetypes and are worth picking early they fit into multiple color combinations and uh overall are just good cards in most decks they're in so definitely worth early picks uh on the other end of the spectrum there is trail of crumbs which is a great food payoff it also gives you a food itself and even though it does look a little bit clunky it is definitely a nice worthy payoff for those food decks that want a little bit of extra food going around um and just you can use the food for a variety of things you sacrifice the food to any source uh not just to gain three life which is what food does it's two it's an artifact that you can pay two to sacrifice to gain three life and so essentially with trail of crumbs you can pay three uh, instead of just two and then you get to look and actually gain card advantage but you would ideally be sacrificing those food to other means and then using the trail of crumbs in addition to that so trail of crumbs is definitely a nice little addition and then in red blue there is a nice build around theme of drawing your second card each turn and improbable alliance and mad ratter are the best because at, at paying off for that at the common and uncommon level because those uh, are going to be creating cards that affect the board so when you're playing your card draw you're also affecting the board which is quite nice i will say that that deck is incredibly uncommon reliant because you do need those improbable alliances and mad ratters if you're going to be trying to go for the draw two cards a turn synergies but if you do get those they are definitely fun and powerful build arounds moving on to cards that are better than they look uh, we're going to start off with golden egg it looks innocuous but it really does a ton it gives you food payoffs it gives you mana fixing and is overall a great card next is ferocity of the wilds which is a card i was very down on for most of the format but then once you start playing i started playing it i realized that it actually does a lot if you are in an aggressive deck that has a lot of non-humans which is typically going to be red green that is the best home for it and mostly the only deck you're going to want to play it in because red green is home to the most non-humans it just does a lot it buffs a bunch of your creatures and trample is incredibly relevant so i think ferocity of wilds is a nice card not necessarily an early pick because it is mostly a red green card rather than just a red card but definitely nice next is revenge of ravens which is a card that i thought was going to be terrible but actually turned out to be quite devastating and really a scary card to face if you're playing an aggressive deck uh so definitely one to keep in mind it is possible to beat you can sometimes be just a deck that doesn't care about it if you're milling your opponent out you could be a deck that has some big creatures like five fives or six fives that just hits them and takes the damage as part in stride but there are definitely a lot of decks that rely on chipping in with some two twos every turn and revenge of ravens shuts those down quite well scalding cauldron is also a card that is better than it looks specifically during the draft portion because if you take one of these relatively early like if you like first pick a red card second pick a green card and then you have a third pick option of taking a scalding cauldron it delays your decision which is just a fun little term about this set that was often used on certain podcasts but you can use scalding cauldron and uh you just don't have to decide which colors you are for a little bit longer which gives you more looks to see what's open and then you can end up in a deck that is heavier into one color whereas if you say uh waffle a little bit more between your colors like you take a third pick blue card you go red pick red card green card blue card and then you'd like waffle between your picks you're not going to be as solidly into one color as you would be otherwise so scalding cauldron definitely gets a little bit better in the drafting portion and it's just a solid card next is forever young this card really does work against mill decks really is just a nice grindy tool for black decks to give yourself a lot of card draw and it's one that every black deck pretty much wants one copy of so definitely a card that looks that play out much better than it looks initially moving on to cards that are worse than they look uh we start off with skull knocker ogre which is just a basically like pretty bad stats statted creature and then its ability is a downside because if this card is in play your opponent can start holding lands and then they'll just randomly get to like discard lands and draw towards more spells so skull knocker ogre is better left unplayed mantle of tides also it looks like it's a card draw payoff but the stats are not worth it plus one plus two it's way too expensive to equip and overall there's not something you're going to be looking to play fortifying provisions is another one that you're not going to want to play the bonus on toughness just doesn't really do enough and the fact that it gives you a food doesn't do enough so this card's also best left in the sideboard uh and then queen of ice is another card it's playable but it looks much better than it actually is because the you never really use the rage of winter ability as well so like if you end up using this for five mana it's like a five mana two three that taps a creature so it's just like a very expensive frost links which is a three mana two two that has like a very similar effect so queen of ice is just not an ideal card though it is playable i just want to mention that it is worse than it looks because it does look quite nice at least it did to me when i first saw it moving on to some combos in the set we're going to kick things off with one of the best combos in the set and also a combo that has terrorized standard which is oven plus cauldron familiar these are both uncommons but if you get the chance to speculate on a witch's oven it can just be a fine card to play in your food decks and then you get a cauldron familiar a little bit later and it does a lot of good work cauldron familiar is also just a good like a fine card on its own if you're in a food deck so if you 
uh, are just trying to build like a little bit of a food deck, you can take a Cauldron Familiar and hope to get a Witch's Oven. It's just a very good combo in the late game. You're going to start draining your opponent for one. Basically, the way it works is you play your Cauldron Familiar, you sack it to Witch's Oven, get a food, sacrifice the food you just got to bring back Cauldron Familiar, and repeat. Another little fun thing you can do is add a Sorcerer's Broom in there. It's not necessary, but then every time you're sacrificing a food, you pay three. Uh, every time you sacrifice the Cauldron Familiar, you pay three, get a broom, and then you sacrifice the food, bring back the Cauldron Familiar, pay three, get another broom, and you just kind of go off. So that's like the trifecta, the ultimate combo that you can assemble, and it is pretty sweet when it goes off. Sorcerer's Broom plus Witch's Oven is also a pretty nice one as well because you can just make like infinite foods, uh, infinite brooms kind of, or just the same broom over and over and just sacrifice it to get a lot of food. So that's a nice combo. Another great combo is Merrileaf Rider plus Out Muscle. You basically use this, you give your Merrileaf Rider indestructible by using the Out Muscle with Adamant triggered. So then you have a 4-2 indestructible, you sack a food, make a creature, be a block the Merrileaf Rider, and then you attack in, kill that other creature. So it gives your Out Muscle a lot of extra value when you do have Merrileaf Rider, and uh, you just want to make sure you have some foods lying around. You can sometimes even do it to make two creatures block Merrileaf Rider and kill both of those. And then finally, Sir Conrad the Grim and Forever Young is a really sweet combo. If you're in the late game, you can use Sir Con have Sir Conrad in play and then play Forever Young. Put a bunch of creatures from your graveyard back on top of your library and burn your opponent for one damage for each creature that has left your graveyard. Because it doesn't say like it leaves your graveyard to your hand, just if it gets put on the top, it also counts. I will also say that Sir Conrad is the best uncommon in the set. It's just such a beating of a card. It may be it doesn't look it as as dangerous but a five man it's a five mana five four with a bunch of text on it but it really does perform it just does so much damage the ability to start milling both players to start dealing damage is really nice and overall sir conrad is a fantastic card in this format and even has some cool combos with forever young next up with some final tips uh, play the adamant lands less than you think you should. These lands look great. There's always that thought, oh, if I can play more lands, I'm using more of my draft picks and I'm getting that extra advantage over my opponent. But a lot of the time, you're not going to want to play these lands unless you have 10 sources of that color. So if I have 10 forests and I'm planning on playing an 11th, I can play my gingerbread cabin. Or if I have uh, 10 planes or 11 planes in my heavy white deck, idyllic Grange can become useful. But where it isn't great is if I have like eight swamps, eight islands, and I'm looking for a ninth black source, and I'm like, oh, I'm going to put a Witch's Cottage in here. Because the benefit you get is not so high for these cards that it's worth the cost of running a tap land. They don't help your mana. They're not double colored lands. And overall, a lot of the time, they're going to just be a hurtful towards your mana base because the effect is very marginal, and you're going to lose more because of not having your fourth land on turn four than you will from having uh, the ability to get these cards really triggered. So I think you would only really want these once you have 10 of the main color and then you use this as your 11th, uh, though with some of them you might even want to go even higher. So with things like Dwarven Mine, you might want to have even 12 or 13 mountains in your deck before you want to put the Dwarven Mine in because it's really not great to have to play a tap land uh, without a huge benefit. And getting a 1-1 is sure it's nice from your land, but it's not a huge benefit. I think Gingerbread Cabin, for the record, is probably the best one because the food can actually be used for a lot of your cards if you have a nice food deck and you're a heavy green deck, like with your Merrileaf Riders and things like that that we already showed. But uh, that's a specifically good combo if you have the Merrileaf plus out muscle is using your Gingerbread Cabin to get that food that you need. But I will say that a lot of the time you're going to be better served putting these cards in the sideboard, even if you are that color, because you do need to be heavy that color for these things to perform. Another final tip is it is not ideal to main deck artifact and enchantment hate, but it is possible. So True Love's Kiss and Return to Nature are like the type of card that in certain formats are really nice in the main deck because they just maybe an artifact or enchantment themed set. And in this set, it's kind of on the borderline. There are a decent amount of artifacts facts and enchantments running around, but it's not so many that it's going to be like perfect to main deck them. You can main deck them, especially if you're a little bit short on playables or you feel like you are particularly weak to certain cards. So for example, if you are a blue-red deck that relies on improbable alliance making you 1-1 fairy tokens to win you the game, uh, I guess that's not really a great example because these are green-white cards. But if your deck is really reliant on 1-1s to win you the game and you think that you can't possibly beat a Revenge of Ravens ever, then maybe main decking a True Love's Kiss gets a little bit better. But generally, you just best left leaving these in the sideboard and then boarding them in if you are playing best of three. Though when Throne of Eldraine is coming back to Arena, it is best of one. So most of the time you're not going to play these cards, but they are certainly playable if you get a little bit short on playables or if you're a heavy white deck and you just need some extra white cards for that, uh, getting a better mana base and things like that. That is going to do it for this video though. I do hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for watching. Remember to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and comment if you have any questions or feedback, and leave a hashtag Eldraine ready to let me know you made it all the way to the end of the video. I am certainly very excited for Throne of Eldraine myself, and I hope this video got you a little bit excited as well for the set, because it is a ton of fun, and I think you're going to enjoy it. That is going to do it for this video though. I hope you enjoyed it, and I will talk to you next time.